Placing your largest asset into trust is an important decision and one that you're only going to make once in your lifetime. Because of this, most people have questions and these questions are fairly common. So today, what I thought I'd do is read an email that I had with a client recently and answer the most common questions that people have about using trusts. Hi, I'm Mike Pugh from MPD Estate Planning. And this week, we're gonna be answering the most common questions people have. Let's read. Dear Mr. Mike Pugh, you can call me Mike. Thank you for explaining trusts and how they work and the benefits to both myself and my son on Zoom last week. You're welcome. From knowing very little about trust to watching your videos, it is a lot to take in. It is. So I put together this email to clarify my situation and ask for some further questions. I don't want to initiate something that proves a problem for me or causes future complications for my son and three grandchildren. That's wise. Just to confirm my details and situation, I am 91 years old. I married my husband in 1959, and in April of 1972, we moved to Slough. This was the first house we owned ourselves. It had a mortgage. In 1984, my husband passed away suddenly. I remained in that same property until 1999, and then I moved from there to my current address near Reading. I never married again. As discussed, my property is freehold and is currently valued in the region of $650,000 and I have approximately $150,000 in cash savings consisting of savings accounts, ISA, and some shares. The house that I live in today is a direct result of all the hard work that both my husband and I put in over the years. We both arrived from South Africa in the late 1950s with very little money. Therefore, it's important to me that I can pass the house my main asset, to my son, and then on to my three grandchildren so that in the future they can benefit from it. The fact that a trust can last for 125 years means it can also benefit my great-grandchildren. All correct. I know from others telling me that the probate process can be long and expensive. So if having a trust avoids this, it is a bonus. Finally, it's important to me that the money and the assets my late husband and I worked so hard for stay in my family line and benefit my son his three children and their children, should they have them. I currently have one great grandson. Congrats. Nowadays, there have been a lot of remarriages due to death, and with the divorce rate so high, I realize it is very easy for my hard-earned money to easily go out of my family. My understanding of my current situation stands today without a trust is, when I am no longer here, leave my estate and savings currently totaling around 800,000 pounds. My inheritance tax allowance is 325,000, plus as I would leave my property initially to my son, and if he is not around, to my three grandchildren mentioned above. As a result, I would qualify for an additional 175,000 pounds of property tax relief. Correct. You told me my deceased husband's allowance was 325 and 175, and that could also be passed on and added to my allowance. So based on my current assets, there would be no inheritance tax for my estate to pay on my death. That would be correct. If my son or grandchildren eventually inherit the property and then go on to sell it, would they be liable to pay any taxes? So here's a classic lawyer answer. It depends. There would not be any inheritance tax because the estate's 800,000 and there's the dual no rate band and dual residential no rate band, so a million pounds in relief. However, if they sell the house shortly after your death, then there should be little by way of capital gains taxes However, if they sell the house years and years later, then naturally there will be capital gains taxes to be paid. Next question. I understand that as things currently stand, probate would be required. The truth here is the government requires probate. Nobody's gonna get a hall pass just because they like you. And if the legal title to your home is in a trust, meaning there's no mortgage on the property, then the home will pass via the trust and pass immediately. What this means is your trustees, your kids, would be allowed to sell the house immediately and not have to wait eight to 18 months for the grant of probate. I understood I could possibly lose control of my property if my circumstances were to change. So the answer to that is the trustees can be you and your son. And based on your age at 91, I would probably recommend that you use trustees that do not include you so that it would probably be your son and your 18 year old grandchildren as the co-trustees. It sometimes look a little too convenient for people at an advanced age to also be trustees, settlers, and beneficiaries of a trust here in the UK. Moving my property and financial assets into a lifetime trust. With your help, I set up a lifetime trust and with your help and guidance, I correctly move my assets into the trust. That's the plan. Question one, would transfer my assets into a trust initiate tax charges for me, my trustees, or my beneficiaries to pay? Short answer, no. 
Question two, will you help me ensure that my property and the correct assets and accounts are added and that the trust is set up properly? Yes, that's literally what we do here, absolutely. Question three, will I have to notify HMRC or will you do this for me? We will handle all of the land registry filings on behalf of your trust and moving your house into that trust. And we're going to give you advice and guidance on how to register the trust with the trust registration service. It's easier for you to register your trust with the HMRC TRS because you know your UTR numbers, P-A-Y-E, and for you to do this yourself will take about 15 minutes. The government websites are pretty good. Question four, do I, the trustees, or the beneficiaries of the trust have to keep records and maintain the trust? The short answer is, it is helpful if you take an annual minutes meeting so that you and the trustees meet once a year to discuss what the trust is going to do in the following year. And the short answer there is, the trust isn't gonna do anything, you still live in the house, the house is in the trust, job done. So you and the trustees sign a document, takes five minutes, that's it, little piece of housekeeping, that's it. But what that does is that shows that there's some continuity that the trustees are actively looking after the interests of the trust. Question five, do I, the trustees or the beneficiaries of the trust have to file annual tax returns for the trust? Short answer here, no. If all that's in the tr trust is your home and your home is not generating an income, therefore there is no income tax to be filed, no income means no income tax, pretty simple. Do I, the trustees or beneficiaries of the trust, have ongoing or yearly trust-related costs? No. Whenever we set up a trust for a family, we recommend that it is family members who are acting on behalf of the trust. If you have a professional involved as a trustee, they have a reasonable expectation of being compensated or paid, but in 90 plus percentage of cases, it's just mom and dad or an individual placing a home into a property, and it should be family members as trustees. There shouldn't be any ongoing or running costs. Time moves on. I am no longer here, but the trust continues. I understand that in a trust, probate is avoided. How does this now work? What happens in place of probate? So the answer here is the main residence, if there is no mortgage, will have its legal title transferred into the trust. This immediately passes to the beneficiaries of the trust post-death, and the trustees can then go off to sell the trust as long as legal title's in the trust. What that means is there's no mortgage on the property. If there's a mortgage on the property, then all that's going to be in the trust is the beneficial interest, and the house will have to go through the probate process. So if you have an unencumbered home, and you put that into a trust, then you don't have to worry about your kids waiting eight months to 18 months to be allowed to, to sell the property and deal with the grant of probate and all the related issues. So let's say you, you've put the, the home into the trust, and the legal title goes into the trust. Well, the property can be sold immediately by the trustees, your kids the value of the property would still be included in the calculation of any inheritance taxes because you still lived in the property. So it was inside of your estate for IHT calculations. Slight difference there, but for this case where we're under a million pounds, there's not gonna be an inheritance tax charge anyway. Do the trustees or the beneficiaries of the trust have to keep records and maintain the trust such as yearly tax returns? Again, no. If the asset in the trust is your main residence, the main residence does generate an income, there's no income tax to file. If the property is rented out or the money is invested, I presume there is tax to be paid on income. Short answer there is yes. Now, if the property is rented out after you die, this is a different universe of possibilities. This is not the original universe of possibilities we're talking about. This is now post-death and the kids decide to hold on to the property and now they're gonna let it out. Will there be income tax to be paid? Yes. The truth of it, is, however, is that this is, these are all good possibilities because what it really means is that the family has held on to the money. The money didn't disappear to care fees, didn't disappear to litigation or bankruptcy or divorce or any of that stuff. So what do you do about rental income in a future event where the kids decide to rent it out? Well, there are two options there. The trust can receive the income and the trust will pay a 45% income tax rate, which is quite high. The second option is the trustees can mandate, meaning they can make a decision as trustees, to appoint the income to someone else. Now that individual receives the income and they will declare that on their self-assessment. Often this is at a much lower rate than the 45% the trust will charge. And so this only makes sense for the trustees to decide that one of the beneficiaries or their spouses or somebody in a lower income self-assessment bracket declares that income and you discharge income tax through that mechanism. All perfectly fine. Finally, you mentioned that ideally I should stay out of care for at least two years. Why was that and can you clarify? Well, there's a video that I'll link at the end of this video 
between my mentor, Dr. Paul, and I back in August of 2022, where we're discussing the local authority ombudsman slapping down local authorities because they're being hyper-aggressive in seizing homes off the elderly for care fees. And whilst there is no hard and fast rule, the determination is that if you put your property into trust more than two years before care becomes an event, there's a high likelihood that you won't have any problems. It is very hard for anybody to prove that you've done this deliberately to defeat care fees when in fact you're doing it because you're concerned that maybe one of your children is going to get a divorce. Maybe you're concerned that you want to make sure the assets go down to your lineal descendants, your grandchildren and great-grandchildren. These are all legitimate use cases of a trust. It just so happens that if you've done the planning sufficiently in advance of the bad things before they arrive, it can provide all these different protections. Finally, would setting up a trust at my age this lady's 91, bring me to the attention of HMRC as you mentioned that a trust would need to be registered with them. The short answer is no. You're welcome to establish trust planning at any age. Of course, the sooner you get to it, the better, right? The longer in advance of bad things happening, you can establish trust planning, the more effective it is going to be. What are the disadvantages of setting up a trust at my age? Remember this lady's 91. Well, for the intended purposes that she's discussed, wanting to make sure it goes down to her and her blood relations, there is literally no downside to this. You quoted me a total price of 5,340 pounds. And yes, that is a fact. These are our published prices. We are the first and probably only company, as far as I'm aware, that gives a detailed price breakdown both on our website and on a YouTube price video, explaining how we actually uh, understand prices, how we delineate. Prices are generally based on the size of the estate and the amount of tax planning and uh, overall planning that's going to be required to be put in. Thank you very much for your time, help, and assistance. It is very much appreciated. I will wait to hear from you. Well, thank you very much for your detailed email. I intend to turn these questions into a video and that might just help others. Of course, I'm not releasing any of your personal information. After I receive your reply and all being well, we can set a second meeting and proceed. Kind regards, yours sincerely, DW. Well, DW, I look forward sincerely to meeting with you online shortly. So that's it for this week. I hope this helps. If you found this video to be helpful and it did answer a couple of your questions, please be sure to smash that like button. It helps the algorithm and this could help another family. It won't cost you anything. And of course, if you'd like to follow along and get more information, I release a long form video every week. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button. See you in the next one.